Welcome to True House Stories coming out of New York City. I'm Lenny Fontana, and I got a special, special guest. When I say UK legend, iconic, it's too small. <laughs> Let's just say this man is in everything. Big sports guy, okay? For those that know, he loves his football, loves his family, especially his son, and he will jump on and off planes to come back in and out of the UK when he's doing Europe to make it to all his son's games and be part of his life. And it's a very respectable thing and a great family man. Also created a business with his brother and father together. And I'm going to let him tell that story clearer, okay? In a tool shed. Nice, right? <laughs> in a tool shed. No dreams of aspiring to becoming a billionaire, which is on his way to becoming at the time. But, you know, with all of us, we started with a dream of love, the love of music. And with music, you just don't know what avenues it's going to take you down, the people you're going to meet. You know, you talk about Grammy nominations, you talk about awards, you talk about playing for thousands of people. But yet it all begins in the beginning at a bar. And that's where you hone your craft, in the bar, in your town. And if you could keep people on that dance floor, because remember, these people in the pub are not paying to play. They're paying to drink. And if they don't like the music, they'll go down to the next bar. But this man figured out the formula and took the formula on a greater level. I'd like to welcome to this show the legendary UK. Recording artist, record producer, remixer, Mr. Mark Knight. All right, my man. Lenny, that was one hell of an, an intro. I mean, you should maybe think about getting a job in the boxing. I mean, that is one way to enjoy. I don't know if I've got anything left after that, mate. You pretty much nailed it in the intro. Thank you for having me, and I'll catch up with you soon. <laughs> and have a good night, everyone. So first off, I know you're in the celebratory mode, so you can tell everybody what's going on in your world for two room and all. Wow, always loads going on. It's, you know, it's hold on uh, by the seat of your pants. We've always got a million projects happening. And we just celebrated 20 years uh, with Tour Room, which is a, a huge milestone for us. Just thank you, mate. Um, but, you know, it's not about being retrospective and pat ourselves on the back. We we acknowledge it. And it was nice to get the, the Beatport Award for the biggest selling label um, within our 20 years. It really means that we've continued to do the right things over a long period of time. But for us, it's always about tomorrow and not yesterday. And uh, some incredible music, some incredible new artists. The story continues. Okay. Well, I know I'm a big fan of the label. Thank you. I've, um, close friends with your brother. And I've been with your brother, Hobnobbing. He used to come to my gigs many, many moons ago. Oh, we did, mate. We followed you. I mean, you've got a lot, you've got a lot to answer for in all of this. I know, I know, I do. I'm, I'm, I'm guilty as charged, right? I'm guilty in the best possible way. So paving the way for everybody else, along with my, along with my colleagues like David Morales and Louis Vega and all of us, of course. But um, it's just wonderful to see that all of you, you know, taking this to that, to that level of, you know, two room records became more as known as a tech house. Of course, I know you got Paradise Fool and all that, you know, the offshoot labels of house music, but. The techie side was really a part where you stabbed through and made your mark in the beginning, you know, to get, I shouldn't say that. In the beginning, I remember hearing house music and then it yeah. cultivated. So I correct myself on that one. I think everything is, the root of everything is house music. Um, there's an evolution of that. You know, if you want to rewind right back to the beginning when I started playing, um, I only connected with, dance music via the medium of soulful house that's how i understood it that's how i accepted it so everything is underpinned with that you know i think soul can be interpreted in, in many ways it's not a binary thing it's an it's an expression it's a feeling um and everything we do i always feel it has to have a connection with soul has to be underpinned with it that's a mantra we've adopted from the beginning it can evolve you know in, in and adapt but it has to have that continual narrative going the way through it 
um, because that's how I understand music. I don't understand music with a lack of soul. It doesn't connect with me. And as you said in the intro, everything that we do is love orientated. You know, it, it starts has, to be. With, has to be, you know, because no one ever got into the rightly into the music industry without doing it for love. If money follows, then great. You know, not only have you done something with integrity and love, you've also been rewarded with that financially. And I think that is always the driver. We don't look at things from a commercial uh, perspective initially. Of course, we appreciate we're running a business. You know, we need to pay everyone. It needs to maintain and be sustainable. But the thing that connects you to a record, and that is the same feeling you get whether you're 10 years old going to a record store initially, or if you're 50 years old and you're signing records, that buzz of hearing something that connects with you is always the primary driver in everything we do. 100%. So, how does music find you as the young? Now, I'm going to show this picture, everybody. Check this out, everybody. Guess <laughs> oh, you tell me now. Well, at, least oh, two, young. at least two partners in crime you oh. became known as the, uh, the two heads of a major label in dance music. How does music find you as a young kid, you know, teenage years? Um, I kind of almost stuck out of school because I had this overarching passion for music and not mainstream music, something that was quite specific. You know, we, we grew up in a rural part of the UK in Kent. Um, we weren't in London. Um, so seeking out soul and early hip hop, um, was a challenge because, you know, we weren't in an urban environment where we had easy access to pirate radio so to discover music um that was more niche was a real endeavor but i lived for it i absolutely lived for it i lived for that whole process of hearing something on the radio listening to tastemakers that educated me whenever and however i could and then hunting it down and finding it was uh, my saturday afternoon and and lifelong passion it started when i was 10 i'd go to football training in the morning and then i'd get a bus into town and spend the whole afternoon searching record searching for records that i would written down in the week listening on my mum and dad's little tiny radio you know trying the best to move it around the house so you could get a connection to glr or solar or any of one of those pirate radio stations from from back in the day that were playing soul and boogie and funk and disco um and an electro and, and then trying to join the dots between the great things I'd heard on the radio and actually owning the physical product. Okay. So, you know, I mentioned in the, in the, in the, in the beginning about this idea that you were going to become a professional footballer. Is was that? That was always the dream. Yeah. Well, that what was happened? Dream. What happened? Tell us what happened. See, nobody knows. Oh, that. You know, I think the bottom line weren't good enough is, is the reality. Um, yeah, I, I pushed it as far as I could. And I think in your heart of hearts, you get to a point of realisation when you're 18, 19, you think, well, do you know what? This is never going to quite be a thing. And, you know, music was always running side by side, you know, uh, and it had more momentum. And, and I felt that I had more um, opportunities uh, in that world. And it was equally as fulfilling and passionate for me. So it wasn't like, I'd lost, you know, it was, it was two great choices and I, I, I chose music. I know ironically now I have a, a large football business as well. So I've kind of got to, uh, to, to finally have a, a, a kind of paid career in music as in football, sorry, as well as music. So I'm, I'm dancing at both parties, which is well, great. Mention, what's the football? Is it two room football or no, it it's, a, it's, it's a business called ballers. Uh, you can find us at uh, www.ballers.co.uk. It's a kind of football heaven. It's a, it's a big football dome on, on the uh, car park of a, a huge mall just outside London. Um, and inside we have a pitch. We have a skill zone with all these different football games. We've got a bar. We've got TV show and football. Um, it's, and it's taken to the next level. We designed software when you play the, play the game. And you score, you get real-time playbacks on the screen. We've got all crowd noises. It's like an immersive um, game of football as well as uh, as playing football. Great facilities. It's like playing if you were at Wembley or something like that. We've got all the atmospherics. We've got all the lights. We've got the tunnel that all lights up and the tunnel music. So um, it's uh, a really interesting football concept that I've done with um, Rio Ferdinand and Bobby Zamora. 
and some other guys who, who are uh, um, England, ex-England players and friends of mine. Um, so it's been great, yeah, to finally fulfil both dreams, really. And uh, I guess I'm living my life uh, through my son as well, who's an incredible footballer, way, way better than I ever was. So um, he's going to be the man. He's going to he, take. He's going to carry the torch for you. Listen, mate, I'm only been warming fact things up wait, for him. I'm just wait, a warm up back. Wait, 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 hang on. Are you going to be like Tiger Woods' dad on the side with Tiger Woods? I mean, yeah, a bit. Uh, you know, but. Uh, yeah, I never. I've, look, all I do, and most things I do, my my mantra in life now is just to open doors for him. Use uh, the profile and the visibility that I've gained to open doors for him. Whether he runs through them, that's up to him. I'm not going to run through it for him, but I'll you know give him all the opportunities, all the facilities, uh, as you would as a dad. You know whether he chooses to run through it is his his call, but. Yeah, I can't keep up with him. He, you know, whether we're playing golf or football, he's an outstanding sportsman, you know. So, yeah, I'm just the warm-up back, mate, let me tell you. <laughs> no, congrats on your son because, you know, like it's hard to be in this business and keep family so prioritized, you know, and I have to take my hat off to you. Thank you, mate. Um, yeah. It's, Ibiza! It's passion yes a beefy yes indeed oh, here's, the the thing about honest. here's the thing about a beat because you know i do my due diligence mate as i always do but everyone that comes on this show around 16 years old you found god or jesus in ibiza you're gonna have to tell us about that you know how it all because everybody finds their way okay footballs you're still loving football you're dating yep. you're, you're out with your lads doing the world but there's that moment that it's like like for some of us, it was going to the Paradise Garage. For some of us, going to Ministry of Sam. Some of us going to yeah. Club Coup in Ibiza. Give us that moment when it all starts for you. Well, with 16, I just left school. It was the first lads' holiday. I'd never drunk before or anything, you know. I was committed to sport. And we took a little sabbatical within that kind of, uh, uh, I guess, abstinence from, from all things naughty. You know, I really wasn't that kid. You know, I was completely committed to sports. So drinking at a young age just didn't even enter my world. It just that wasn't that wasn't on the radar. So we decided to book. We finished our exams and I was just turning 16. And we said, right, let's, you know, let's book a holiday. And just by chance, you know, through no understanding of what was going on, uh, went to Ibiza and it was like a bit of an epiphany. I was like, oh, my God, what is this? Um, and although I never kind of I was only 16, I was still very much committed to sport at the time. So, you know, it wasn't like, I, I, you know, I was part of that shoe movement and all of that things at the late uh, the end of the 80s um, because I was still very much in sport mode. But I got a window into a world that I knew nothing about and that, you know, that left the mark um, and, you know, was imprinted in the future and was, I guess, part of the, the blue plan, uh, the blueprint of what became my, my career later on in life. You know, we went to Amnesia before it had a roof and it's like, that was an eye opener. And we went to as Paradise when it all filled up with water. And I was like, what the, fuck is this this is nuts this is you know i hadn't really even been to clubs you know not adults clubs i've been to junior clubs and sneaked in you know anywhere that played decent music i would have gone i've been to concerts i've seen ll cool j at the time and dmc and mc and um those kind of things but never been to like a dark house music club you know not really because a i wasn't into it i didn't really know it and understand it it wasn't really a thing anyway pre pre that time um but it was an incredible window into a fantasy world in uh, of something that i knew nothing about and yeah definitely left an imprint that was for sure so you weren't so you weren't djing yet right you just went there as a lad's holiday yeah lad's holiday no i wasn't de djing as you well know around that time it wasn't a thing it wasn't you know not now where you can take you know we, we even do a degree here now in, in, in dj it wasn't a thing it was you know, I, I massively respected selectors and DJs on the radio and stuff, but as a touring entity, you know, someone who had a, it was wasn't really a thing. So no one aspired to. There wasn't an aspiration, a path to that, um, because it wasn't an established thing. You know, you, it was just if you're a kid, your dream was to play, you know, professional football, and that was it. And not a music, a DJ, and house music, you know, was at its most embryonic stage. So. 
that hadn't even established into a culture and a scene yet. But we had a, a snapshot of that back in 89, you know, when it started to get a bit more momentum and it just blew my head off. I was like, what the fuck is this? It's, this is nuts. So, so who's the guy that said, come here, let me show you what blending's all about or mixing, you know? Or well, I, I have to say, I mean, you know, we... Anyway, we come back um, and then it was business as usual, back to football and whatever, and it was just a mad experience. And then you kind of get to the 18, 19, when you, you know, the point, you think, well, is it going to connect? Is it going to be a thing or is it a pastime? And I just realised it become, you know, a hobby more than anything. I was playing a lot of basketball as well at the time, and I was doing really well with that, um, as you can see in the background there. Um, and that, you know, I was actually gaining more because it was – a less exposed sport I was actually getting kind of further down the line with, with that as well. And I was playing a lot of that, trying to balance it all, but there was definitely no career path in the UK and basketball in the late eighties. Let me tell you, I mean, the dream was that I could get a scholarship and go to the U S but you know, pre internet and pre um, emails and things like that, that was almost a near impossible thing. So um, yeah, we, you know, we just, Life moved on and we started to go out in the early 90s to the Ministry of Sound and to Garage City and all those things um, and fell in love with the culture of it, you know, through through the medium of soulful house music. You know, it was an extension of what I knew, you know, late 80s, early 90s. I was the biggest swing beat fan in the history of swing beat. Let me tell you, there was a swing beat record I wasn't across. Um, thanks to people like Steve Jervia and, and that in the UK, you know, that was my thing. And I just felt there was a a correlation between more up-tempo soul um, and drum programming in that and then house music. And, you know, listen to Ten City and Masters at Work and that. I, it joined the dots. I could see the connection. Um, and we started going out and then I was like, you know, I've always been mad about music, absolutely obsessed buying music, thinking, well, maybe, the, you know, all of these things I've done from the age of 10, this, this absolute passion for buying music. Now there's uh, a forum and, and the way that I can actually present all this to music that I my passionate to people via DJ and, and m myself and my brother bought a set of decks and Stu, to be fair, nailed it first. He, he was the one who, who, who mixed first and that, you know, we've been very, very competitive and there he is gloating in his, <laughs> in his glory, <laughs> looking down on me. Um, uh, you know, he, we've been super competitive. I'm like, right, if Stu can do it, I've got to learn how to do it. You know, I've got, you know, I've, I've been buying this music forever. So this has got to be a thing. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm quite, um, what's the word? Driven. But to, to, say, but to be fair, Mark, I remember Stuart coming to those gigs and being a real train spotter. Trying to oh, we both were. Well, I mean, he, he, oh, he was nerdy. monotonous with that. Yeah. What's that record? What's that record? Oh, equally as nerdy, if not more than me. So, you know, we both had this, you know, inherent passion for it. And, um, but I just kind of got more into the, the DJ and so on. Like, wow, you know, I, I want to play music to people that I'm passionate about. I, I, look, all these records I've got and collated, look at them as this story. And, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very driven. I'm one of these guys, if I do something, I'll do it to the absolute max um rightly or wrongly um and yeah I, I started to play it as you said in the intro you're playing bars you're playing pubs you you, you enter via that that way that 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 kind of uh that process and um, playing to no one you know five people as you said which is is the challenge you know when i played festivals now to fifty thousand people that's easy no one's going anywhere you, know, you pay big money to come and you're not leaving but when you've been in, when you're in a bar and you're playing to five people, you've got to think about every record, not overdoing it, not underdoing it. So, you know, really hone my craft and learn it real time in those in those instances. And then it scaled up. See, here's the thing now. People understand, you know, they think that this 50,000 arena is, is a difficult experience. It's a Difficult experience to keep 30 people in a place where you can't lock the door. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, Absolutely. Yeah. And changing your musical styles to knowing to what your crowd is, you know, into. And yeah. understanding what you're dealing That's with. That's DJ, with. man. Like, like, I, I did a gig, actually. Look, it happens. You know, even at this, I did a gig in Spain on Sunday and it wasn't very busy. And like the guy I played before just kind of went on and just did what he normally does. I'm like, the context is he's totally wrong. So it was too hard. So I just went on and just started playing disco. 
and then instantly all the girls knew one was on the floor and look, there was only 100 people there in the venue that probably held 400 so it wasn't packed so you couldn't get it wrong because you know it would go wrong they'd all leave so and it's about understanding how to go into those environments and go look this is where i'm at and this is what's going to work this is the this is the right soundtrack to this uh this moment um and that applies you know that same thing applies 30 years ago when i was learning 35 years ago when i was learning to, to the present day till sunday you know a few days ago so that never changes and you have to you have to go through that to know how to get the most out of those instances and people come on, oh it's a nightmare we're busy i'm like do you know what it's actually more fulfilling more fulfilling to go into something and really dig in and go right this is going to test me now you know what i mean then just go up because we do so many shows you know you can go through the motions let's not go through you know it's not bullshit about it. it you people want to hear certain records you've got two hours you don't get the creative bandwidth to, to be too versatile so you've got to deliver and that could be a bit repetitive you know it is it is the honest answer to that um but when you go into a situation that like that it's like well, okay you really got to know how to dj to make this situation work and that for me in a lot of ways can be more rewarding than have three thousand people jumping up and down to something i know is going to work so you understand the difference of the turntable generation posed to the digital generation how do you feel when you see people around us that the pioneers are not on electrically? Oh, I, I don't get that. How, I just, how do you I feel mean, really about that? Oh, it really hurts me. Like, what was that that girl who DJed? I don't know her name. Uh, um, Coachella, who couldn't DJ. I mean, more fool the, the the promoter really booking someone who can't do like. I can't get, I know I've tried to get on Coachella for years, right? Just can't get on. And I, you know, I think I've got the hang of DJing now, like after the last 30 years. And I think there's quite a few markers in my career that would, you know, perhaps afford me the opportunity to play in that environment based on merit and ability. And more for the promoters for giving up a slot to 15,000 people to someone who can't fucking DJ. What are you doing to our scene? What are you doing to the longevity of, what we've spent years honing and building uh, through passion, giving up that slot to someone who can't DJ. And I, in, in a lot of ways, I hope this gets back to culture. I hope they see that because that's the honest answer. Yeah, well, I've said the same thing. I, I've also put it up. I'm like, look, you know, she's a singer. You're making her a DJ now. Got it. But did anybody explain to her what the beginning stage of what this is going to be like? Or was it a publicity stunt? We don't really know. We have to, we'll wait to see. I don't know, but it's a bit like saying, I've just taken two singing lessons. All oh, right, fine. Well, why don't you, uh, why don't you headline Coachella as a singer? <laughs> you wouldn't do it. <laughs> do you know what I mean? We're going to give you a main oh, slot. Because what are you doing? You know, if you're a wrestler, then all of a sudden you go, right, I'm going to become a singer. But you had no experience, but then throw you in. What's that doing to the future of singing? And, you know, it's the same just because it, look, with a great, but with it in a digital world that we do it, it's an easier thing to do, you know, in terms of actually going through the basics of it. It is, it's not that difficult. Let's be brutally honest in the digital world now. I could teach my mum to DJ in about four hours, right? I could. Now, can my mum put a set together? No. Can she press play uh, and count in and, and count in fours? probably yes so it's it's you know it's a lot easier thing to do now um it's less of a tactile thing when it was in vinyl you know, there was a lot of emphasis on the actual blend as opposed probably more so on just getting them two things to work together from a, an analog perspective than the, the story we were trying to tell you know and i actually think in this day and age it shifted the emphasis when done in the right way to to creating a longer narrative and the thing that's actually genuinely more important than the blend is the story you're telling. Um, but we're in a world now where that can happen, but it's wrong of promoters to be looking for that quick fix and putting someone in there. And that just backfired on not every level. And, and, you know, I get embarrassed by things that I think oh, that's what I do. Like someone's up there and they were, you know, you're not, you're not in the same league and you're not, you're not you're not a dj you're not you're up there someone pressing play and i just think it's uh it's a shame that we are encouraging and supporting that as a as a as a movement it's not it's not good okay so when you were grafting around 17 18 years old 1920 
what exactly were you doing is for work besides DJing? And when did this idea come together for you to start a, a, as crazy as it sounds, a record label? <laughs> well, I was in the construction industry. You know, when I left school, um, you know, you needed it. If you were playing semi pro football, you needed a job as well because you, were, you weren't enough money. There weren't money in it to, to some. So I got a job in construction. Um, and I always did, I did that for 10 years. Um, and it was the best, I think, to come through. Um, hands-on work and understanding the value of that um, really gives you a perspective when you move into something, you know, in, into arts um, and music industry. And I remember being on a building site uh, one day and I was so cold, I couldn't pick my trail up. I was like, fuck, I've got to do something about this. You know what I mean? And I think when you're backed into a corner, that's when, the, you know, when it happens. And it makes you realise how lucky you are, how lucky we are to be in this industry, you know, not so I, I mean, I'll go back to building in a heartbeat. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I love construction. It was, you know, all, always what I wanted to do, but I worked with my granddad when I was uh, from the age of 10, every summer holidays, I was on a building site working with him a lot of the time because I was in, it meant I could be in London, listen to the radio as well at the same time, but I loved construction and I did that as well as, but, um, it was a business decision. You know, I was working in the day um, and then in the evenings doing music. And I had a very fortunate job at the, nearer towards the end of it where we were putting all the construction in for cable TV. Cable TV was a new thing and we were putting all the infrastructure in and it meant being out and about all day. And my boss, he was so lenient. I'd be like, literally turn up, bang out what I've got to do. And then I'd be in the studio all afternoon. And every time the phone rang, I'd run out into the middle of the street because that's where you were, just some ambient back noise. So I'm, I'm on this job. So for years, it funded my um, my studio activities. You know, I, I was at the time working in Dave Lee, Dave Lee's studio. Um, and, you know, I'd be in a session with him or Kevin or whatever. The phone would ring him. Oh, shit, it's work. They run outside. And then, but it, it got to the point where I had two incomes. You know, I was doing pretty well DJing and I was working in the daytime. And I took the decision to go the leap of faith to say, Do you know what? I think I can make music a bona fide um, and valid financial career. And I, I took the leap of faith. And it was scary at the time because you'd gone from having two incomes to just one. Um, but at the same time, we, me and my wife, um, or the girlfriend at the time, she, we weren't married at that point, we bought our second house um, and there was equity in the house. And we said, well, look, she wanted to go back to university. She always had the dream of being at university. She couldn't go uh, when she left school. And I, I needed the money to build a studio and start and uh, fund the beginning of what was Tool Room. So we sold the house. She moved back to her parents. I moved back to mine. Um, and then the dream that his tour and began. Where exactly yeah. did it begin? Tell everybody where that. Right, began. hence the well. So because I it's like, construction, it's so cool. I like, I like that I'm hearing this backstory. Now I understand why this is the way. It so yeah, so I, I moved back to my parents, and outside their house there was a shed, and we called it the tool shed tool room and it basically had the lawnmower in it all the garden tools and it was just a storage shed for all things you know my tools at the time or or whatever we just used to call it the tool room and i was like mum is it a dad is it any chance i can clear all that stuff out and build a studio in the shed and they were like yeah fine because you know it meant i didn't have to fund finding um an actual uh, a, a facility i didn't need a um we just used the shed. It was a brick building. Um, so I had stripped everything out. I, I built a, a room inside a room because I knew what I was doing through construction. They put a new floor in, wired it, um, put air con in there. And and that was it. That was the tool room. That was um, where we started to put, built the first studio. And there's some photos flying around of that, some old photos. You'll see, see but that's them. cool because people don't understand the financial part. And the, you know, when you're beginning something, especially in those days, it costs it. It's not like now where you could do this all on a laptop. You had no. to buy gear. You had to make a financial investment. And if you didn't have that money, you were stuck. You know, people That's don't right. understand that. That's right. Absolutely. You know, basically the money I I had that um, I'd made through the sale of the house, you know, I apportioned some for um, 
construction of the new studio, some for equipment. You know, at the time I was sharing a studio with Dave Lee. So, you know, I vowed of all of his equipment, you know, with a great the Math 48 channel mixer, uh, Mackie mixer. We had about four or five samplers, you know, which in all fairness, Dave had bought and I and he just let me use them. So I thought, Christ, I've got to buy all this gear now. Um, so I, you know, there was money needed for that. And then also money needed to to live and fund the beginnings of it. You know, I still had to eat. I still had to have some money. So, yeah, put together a bit of a, a kind of financial strategy that allowed me to have some time to start a building a new sound uh, and building the basis, that sound being the basis of what the label was about. When Tool Room began, was it basically you guys going to pocket or did you wind up getting what they call pressing distribution deal on these we had, a, we had a P&D deal um, and the first person to ever give us a P&D deal was Peppermint Jam, um, which was Simon Marlin and Mark Robinson at the time. So respect to those guys. They were the first people that gave us a P&D deal. So we had that through Peppermint Jam initially um and then we moved oh you know, the, the the good old days of moving from distributors we were at marto and we were at, oh you name it we were there but um it it, it was mad people said why are you starting a, a record label this was just at the point of um the real demise of vinyl so you know when labels were going under left right and center you were trying to start one and, but we always envisaged the future and we knew the future was digital and it worked in our favor because our footprint financially it wasn't uh, based on on the vinyl model so you know we didn't see a shift in economics because of the industry had changed we built our economics and our our financial strategy around digital uh, vinyl was just vinyl was a bonus it just allowed us to uh, have some pocket money but we knew the future was digital we got very close to beatport from the very beginning you know jonas is a, a good friend of mine uh who's jonas temple the guy who started beatport and we worked alongside them both businesses were pretty much born at the same time um and we we got very close to them and you know even to this day we beat a test ideas with them. we're still very close to them um and we built our business around being a beatport label and so we still in so, some respects languish in that as a as an entity you know it's hard to even it's evolved into a streaming we're a streaming business now that that you know, well that's that's, it. that's just the way it is now and the vinyl the really? vinyls become more of a luxurious thing now that's like for collectors like you can't make the money well in. even beat even dip you know beat port and track source is still you know what we earn from that compared to what we own spotify is non-comparable really um but it is always the yardstick you know that's always the yardstick of success for me really is getting your getting the respect of selectors of djs that are buying their music through those sites with track source and beatport you know if there's nothing better than getting a beatport or track source number one you know as as a um, as an artist you know what you really want is is the kudos of getting the respect of having a big record and the sales coming from people that are genuinely invested in that scene not being you know okay it's great to have a huge record that's a record that hugely streams but you know that's force fed to the masses you know in um what's the word um in, in playlists that are almost force fed to people so well that's the way the game is then that's, that's the way the game is you know and you need to be able to dance or listen we have to dance at all you gotta parts, dance that right? tango right you got to play that tango but here, here's the thing now the first few years you're grafting, of course, and figuring your way. And then you have the vinyl ending, the digital's beginning. And you're right there as the cusp of this change. Yeah. Which is super cool. What's the breakout record that changes the game for you guys? Well, there, there wasn't one that financially, you know, it wasn't like, oh, Christ, we've landed a hit. And that allowed us. We didn't. I mean, I think not only the career of tour, you know, the, the history of tour and the history of me, it's always been this thing that's slowly evolved up like that, you know, in, in small increments. Um, and that kind of helps with longevity because I think sometimes when you have a huge hit, um, you, you tend to get this peaks and troughs. We never had that. We never had any super lows. We never had any outrageous highs. It's always been a steady ascent to where we want to be. And I think, you know, that, that wins the that wins the race in the end. So there wasn't a record that financially allowed us to move into a different gear. It was an evolution of um, 
lots of good records uh, and continuation lots of good records honing the business model so it was financially lucrative and enough facets and ways to generate money so that if you got everything right and everything added up um and we you know we did everything properly added up to something that was um a good business so it wasn't like well we had a huge hit then i mean if you i guess if you wanted to pick a record that really cemented us as a brand you know and got respect um i think it would have already been hall and brookheimer in the beginning the record that me and martin did um it was just massive in um you know i beat around 2003 you know right at the beginning of, of when we started and you know put a lot of eyes on what we were doing so that record was a game changer in terms of visibility i mean it didn't it didn't change you know didn't allow us to go and buy a yacht let me tell you but um it put a lot of eyes on what we were doing and, and created a lot of heat on you know, what we were trying to uh, trying to achieve and that's important you know everybody needs that first thing that validates you that okay now our you know our dynamic thinking is working because you don't know you're just throwing stuff out there that's what this is about you know and then of course a formula begins that's as right you, you know as you're going when does the DJing really start to thrust for you with along with the tool room brand? You know, I guess 2005 was a big year, was you know, just had a lot of records out, um, in succession. Um, and we were we were doing something different, you know, that's what gave us an opportunity. We we really understood, or I really understood, um from a musical positioning that we had to create our own furrow, we had to create our own sound um and be unique we can take influences for things but fundamentally it comes from the heart it's something that you know i, I love you, i want to well, break in i got to ask you this was there any labels that you were looking at past or present at the time course. who gives give us some of that because i know you guys are sitting around talking at the time I, I guess from a kind of branding and marketing perspective subliminal the way they burst onto the scene and they change the game in their way they're asthetic and their aesthetic and their dynamic approach to branding and and live um what eric did with that was a game changer um and you know in terms of his way the aesthetic of his logo of the record labels they just stood apart from everyone else he nailed branding he nailed brand identity and he and he understood the importance of of live and how you could take that to the masses and purvey his sound they had a sound and they marketed it well uh, and they exposed it well through live and then i guess from a, a recording perspective strictly rhythm just in the fact that they were diverse in what they did but it was all pinned together you all knew it was strictly and that that's a real art to be diverse and, and not repetitive but have a uh, have a narrative in terms of its sonic um that ties it all together so i guess they were the two labels we looked at like, look you know we can take a lot from what they they've done but you know they weren't the first to do that you, you know we go back you look at records like stack uh, labels like stacks chess motown you know go right back um def jam all of those labels knew how to build a roster knew how to build a sound and and i i, I knew that you know this is what we needed to do is to do that and i knew how to do it i knew how i could collectively put a set of artists together to represent in their own individual way what i wanted to provide as a sound um they none of them were on top of each other everyone had their own space but as they joined up they made the sound of tour and it's like being the captain of a football team or the manager and knowing how to pick a side that is gonna you know get your messaging across or get your results together you don't you don't need nine cent you don't need 11 center forwards you don't need 11 right so back you don't need you don't need 23 captains you need you need right. workers, you need you need grafters and then you need leaders that's right and i've always had to be the captain you know i've assumed that role i love that role you know it, it means that i've had to always pave the way in in in, in the way i the way i conduct myself in, in the results you know like if i can't be aspirational how can i ask you to do the same if i i have to leave from the front my records always have to be the biggest selling or try to be you know or the most creative I, I have to you you know always show don't tell if you can show people what you can achieve over a period of 20 years you say listen if you want to be on board this is where we're at this is where the bar is can you play that game are you in or you're out because i'm going to play it every week 
You know, it, you know, you look at the greats in like the Jordans and that, you know, the people like that who are you know, not com comparing myself in any way by, to Michael Jordan. But, you know, that guy asked you to get on board. And he said, this is the stand. This is what we're going to play. You you jump on or, or don't get on at all. You know, and, it, and I, I love that as a mantra. And I try to adopt that in my own way. You know, 20 years down the line, still making sure that I'm at the top of my game because if I can't be the top of my game, how can I, I can I expect you to do that? So, so I say, yeah, no, you're right. And, and, and you know, lead by example, you want always. people to lead. You want, you want to make leaders out of followers, not just be the leader, you know, as well. Um, as you guys are growing, social media is becoming the thing. Yep. What's the ethos of learning how to make that work alongside running a, a label and running Mark Knight and running an artist? How do you split yourself in three or four or five or six or a dozen different ways? <laughs> uh, I guess I do everything that I love, so I don't find it difficult. Um, I don't. I'm not mad on social media personally, but I understand. It's the medium of marketing. That's marketing. That's how we conduct our business. You know, back in the day, we if we wanted to amplify a record, we, it was an analog thing. We had to take out our advertising in the magazines. That was our touch point to a wider audience. That now is Instagram or TikTok or Facebook. So it's just a shift in in, in medium, in platform, um, and with slightly different rules. But it's how we purvey what we want to do as our messaging that's our way of marketing so you have to understand it you have to be across it you have to be progressive in the way it's evolving do you have to adopt it and let it lead you personally no you don't but we need it as a tool you know to to amplify our messaging and and, and create our awareness for the, the music that we're releasing so i get it i understand it parts of it are you know i think a great part of it i'm not so mad of you know, about but it's part of our world. And if you want to be successful, then you need to market. You need to understand both facets of what we're doing here. You know, this is not called the music business for fun. It's called the music business because you've got music and you've got business. And you need to have to, you need to understand both of those things to be successful. It can't all be music and creativity with no business. It can't be all business and no creativity. If you can understand and build a team understand that and everyone's got space within that but collectively join up for the same thing you're going to do well that's a good way of putting it business and music i've said that myself over the years it started out to be a loving music thing and then became a very social media thing and more driven by how many followers you have instead of how great the music is because with some of the artists i'm hearing their records come out records are not that great but because they have a huge following that's where it goes wrong that that's where it goes wrong you know where that has more relevance and more importance than the product um and that is a challenge that's something that i can't accept i find it very difficult and won't affect the way we conduct business it won't because we'll always be about music we don't sign music with our eyes we sign music with our ears and i don't care if it's a guy with three followers you know, in his bedroom, or it's the biggest artist in the world. Is it any good? Is it any? That's the first question and the last question. Is it any good? If it is, then sign it. You know, and if he needs help building him artistically, then we've got the product. We can work on that as a concept. But it starts and stops with how good the music is. Just all that other stuff is following trends and is is short termish. So, unfortunately, we will never adopt adopt that as a principle. Like, oh, you haven't got enough followers. No, man, is your music any good? Just start there. Doesn't that suck? Just saying that, oh, you don't have enough followers, but I really like the track. I really can't sign it because you don't have a fan base. It's just it, it's just the way this game is rolled out. Not with yeah. everyone. Not with not everyone. With no, not with everyone. That, that means your label's not good enough. If you can't, if you can't put out a record by so, a great record um, by someone that no followers, then you've got the problem, not the artist. Say that once again, clear, so everybody can hear that. Say that again, that part that you said about the label and the artist. Right. So if you're a label and you can't put out a record because they haven't got enough following, it's your problem, not theirs, because you're not doing your job. You're not just a. You can't just be an aggregator of new of product. 
You know, you have to build an ecosystem of tribe, of following that is so warmed up you know, because through your endeavours, through your integrity, through your consistency of great music, that when you put a product in from someone who isn't known, but it's still really good, they accept it. So the only, they've got let record labels who say things like that. It's it's a it's a failing on the record label and not the artist. I'm going to ask one last question because this man's really busy and he's going to have to go. <laughs> I'm going to run to my other business in a minute, football. Is 20, I know, and he's, God bless, he's got, you know, it's it's a blessing to have not one love, but two loves, because I know he loves both of these equally, if not more than one than the other. Um, two rooms, 20 years behind. Yep. 20 years in front. If we're running the Olympics, who is your competition, and where do you see yourself on that marathon for the 20 year forward now? Well, let me tell you, we're going to win. That, that's that's now you're right. really that's funny me. that you're really funny. <laughs> we're not losing well, everyone that, that, he's not modest he's very modest everyone uh, listen do you know what i mean it, it's not it's it's a belief in our ability it's not modest it's not bullshit you know what we we might not be at the front of the race the whole way you know there'll be moments you'll you'll fall off and that's okay but continue to run your own race and do it well and do it with love and then you've got a good chance of winning it. And that's that's all we will ever do. You know, we'll stick in our lane. Uh, we'll stick to doing things we love that are, um, and we feel have the tour room ethos and the tour room sound, and we'll keep doing that. And I reckon we've got a good chance of winning. We're 20, 20 years in the race, and we're still at the front. So why shouldn't we be at the front in 20 years' time? Well, that's the difference now from, where, from before. There was no longevity like it is now. Like labels had their time, and I'm seeing even with defected yourselves, CR2, you know, even CR2, he's going on a 20 year anniversary as well. Yeah, um, it's yeah, crazy. Mark. Yeah, congratulations, Mr. Mark. Brown. And you know, I mean, I, and here's the funny part I'm involved with almost everybody of these labels. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, well, every man. label you named, I've been involved with some of my records, so, like you. Yeah. We have either a remix or production or something touring. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. It's same, same with you. No, it's, it's, no. and congrats, man, because that you know that's there is the, the, there's competition between those. There's individuality, so, so to dance at all of those parties is no mean feat. No, and congrats to you guys, because I, I I look look you know this is like the major leagues what we play in in the dance music arena. There's only a few. You know, you can really say that stand out, and you guys are a standout label. You know, Thank you stand. You. you know, I mean, you guys. When we look at, oh, what's Tool Room doing? What's Defected doing? What's such and such doing? What's CR2 doing? You know, and that's just the way it is. You know, there's thousands of labels now, tens of thousands of labels, but yep. there's only a few on one hand that you say, "Wow, artistry." Think, yeah, I releases. Think this social media the whole thing because let me tell you there's there's a difference between a record label and a record company now we're a record company yeah we've got 30 people i'm in the i'm in one of the studios here we've got 30 odd people that work here uh, we've invested in people we've invested in infrastructure um that support what we do you know and that's uh, a business decision um that's that's a huge responsibility listen we could start a record label tomorrow let's call it iphone recording right we're off we've got a record label have we got a record company no we haven't you know that's that's built on everyone assuming the right position within what we're trying to achieve um and building a team collectively with the same vision and same aspiration and drive and togetherness that will realize the potential of of artists so there's a big difference and that's what makes defected us cr2 drum code all of these armada these bigger players they're record companies you know and that there's a difference and when you're prepared to go the next level and back yourself um in terms of manpower investment strategy that's when you change into something different that that has the potential of longevity and that everyone folks is the reason why these people are where they are today and they're not going anywhere they are cemented into the game we wish you all the best, Mr. Thank Brown. you, Lenny. <laughs> Mr. Mark Knight, I was going to say Mr. Brown. Mr. Mark Knight, we love you. And don't leave us. And 
check him out. He's all over the world. He plays in New York. He plays in Florida. He plays in London. He plays in Spain, Japan. The man is everywhere, and his sound is everywhere. Thank you, man. Oh, thanks a lot, man. Thank you so much for having me and everyone for tuning in. I'm actually in the States this weekend. You can catch me in Vancouver on Friday and then uh, I'm at uh, Avalon in LA on Saturday. We've got two big touring shows out there. So hopefully if you're watching in North America, we might see you at one of those. And if not, I'll catch you online. And Lenny, thank you so much for having me, mate. Thank you so much. And stay with us. Hang tight. One second. Everyone take care. Have a great day and a 